and your better. Let's pray with me. Father in heaven, open our hearts, open our spiritual eyes as we open your word. Speak to us and through me. And let the words of my mouth and the meditation of our hearts be acceptable in thy sight. O Lord, our strength and our redeemer. Amen. Amen. Very often in our Christian experience, when we think that we have overcome problems and setbacks and hardships, we realize that the war is not over. There are more problems to come. Giants oftentimes are the problems and pressures and pains and persecutions that we have to face in our daily lives. Giants cause major difficulties and they bring the possibility of threatening our very spiritual existence. What is a giant? A giant is anything in your life that distracts from your focus on God. A giant is anything in your life that detours from your service of God. A giant is anything in your life that drains you of your passion for God. And so a giant distracts you, a giant detours you, and a giant drains you. A giant is anything that you are afraid of. And the giant does not have to be big. If you ever look up the variety of words that psychologists and psychiatrists have invented for our fears, it is very interesting that different people are afraid of different things. And things that I would be deathly afraid of, you have no problems with. I am not afraid of snakes. If a snake crawls across the floor, I will catch it, and I will grab it, and I will admire it. That's not my problem, that's not my issue, but I know for many of you in here, you would be afraid of snakes. We all fear different things, and therefore we have different giants. And because the enemy knows that, he individualizes our giants. He tailors our trials and tribulations to suit our specific fears. But I want you to know today that the devil does not only know what your fears are. It's not only the devil who knows. God knows what our fears are. And he knows how to come and strengthen us when we are vulnerable to the attacks of the enemy. And so what are the giants in your life today? Bad habits? Bad company? Some of you, bad company is not a giant in your life because you don't like people anyhow. <laughs> if you don't have many friends, you stay by yourself, that's not your giant. But for those of you who are social butterflies, who love to be around people, and who get your energy from associating and affiliating with people, that can be your giant. What is your giant today? Is it food? Mm. A whole lot of us in this church are addicted. It may not be to weed, or to heroin, or ecstasy. We are addicted to sugar. That, that may be your giant. I do not hear a good slice of cheese. <laughs> giant! What is your giant today? Is it discouragement? Some of us are easily discouraged. Whatever your giant is today, I want you to know that the God we serve is able to strengthen you and to help you to overcome your giant. Goliath was the world's most famous giant. What you might not have known is that Goliath did not exist in a vacuum. Goliath had a mommy and a daddy. Like the rest of us. Her 
want to get up about Goliath's parents? Goliath had siblings. Goliath had children. And so when he stood in the valley of Eli and he threatened God's people and he dissed them for 40 days and little David stepped out trusted God handled his business knocked Goliath out then cut off his head what news went back to Goliath's parents? What news went back to his siblings? What news went back to his children? We must have all said it serves Goliath right, that uncircumcised Philistine, for messing with God's people. But we never look at it from the other way. The man had family. His family was traumatized by his decapitation. And so begins our journey. Turn with me to 1 Chronicles chapter 20 and verse 5. Let's look and see a little bit more into Goliath's king for. 1 Chronicles chapter 20 and verse 5. The Bible says, and there was war against the Philistines. We know that Goliath was from Philistia. And Elhanan, the son of Jair, slew Lami. Who was Lami? The brother of Goliath the Gittite, whose space staff was like a weaver's beam, six to seven inches thick. So Goliath had a brother who was also a soldier. And in battle, Goliath's brother also got killed by the Israelites. Bible scholars also believe that Goliath had children. First Chronicles chapter 20 and verse 4. The Bible says, And it came to pass after this, that there arose war at Gezer with the Philistines, at which time Sibekai, the Hoskathite, slew Sipai, that was one of the children of what? The giant. And they were subdued. Now, notice the Bible did not use the indefinite article. It didn't say a giant. Could have been any giant. It said, it used the definite article, the giant. Who is that giant that we are talking about in all of these stories? Go ahead. Talk about one giant. And here we have then. The 
Bible tells us that this man, we don't know his name, we could call him Mr. 24. <laughs> he too was slain. So that's three children of Goliath that was slain. But it doesn't end there. There's a fourth son that Goliath had who is the interest of our sermon today. The Bible tells us in 2 Samuel 21, 16, his name was Ishbidinah. The Bible says, and Ishbidinah, which was of the sons of the Vajayat, the weight of whose spear weighed 300 shekels of brass in weight, he being girded with a new sword, thought to have slain David. Understand this is retribution. This is payback. You killed my father. You killed my three brothers. There is blood going on here. I am coming to get you. David was a marked man. They put a hit out on King David. This son of Goliath must have heard and understood what happened when his father was killed. He must have developed a bitter hatred for God's people. He was mad. And in order to celebrate his victory, the Bible says that he didn't use the old sword that he had often used in battle. He got a brand new sword. And he probably wrote David's name on it. And he said, this sword is for one purpose. I'm going to get him back for what he did to my family. And the Bible says, And in those days, kings did not go or they did not stay at home when their men went out to war. You see, the term commander in chief means that when there is a war, you go out on the battlefield and you command the troops and tell them when to move forward and when to pull back. Commander in chief does not sit in the Pentagon and send our young men and women out to be slaughtered. Kings normally led their troops in battle. That is what David was accustomed to doing. Now, David had a problem the last time he decided to stay at home from battle. You remember what happened? It was a springtime when the kings were going out to war to lead their troops, and for whatever reason, we don't know, David decided to stay home. Mm -hmm. And while he was at home, he was walking on the palace wall and he looked over the wall and he spotted beautiful Bathsheba taking a bath. And instead of doing an about face, <laughs> he got his binoculars. <laughs> and the more he looked, the more he saw. And the more he saw, the more he wanted, and you know the story. David got in trouble. The devil always finds work for idle hands to do. And so David learned his lesson, and he decided, okay, whenever the troops are going out, I'm going to fight with them. And so there was war between the Philistines and the Israelites again. David was out there. He was leading his troops as every king would do. But the Bible tells us in 2 Samuel 21, 15, something went wrong. Hmm. You, you read it in our scripture reading? Yeah. The Bible says in, in 2 Samuel 21, 15, moreover, the Philistines had yet war again with Israel, and David went down and his servants with him and fought against the Philistines. The Bible says, and David waxed Faith. He got tired. He was fighting. He was leading. He ran out of steam. Have you ever gotten tired? 
in doing the Lord's work? Mm-hmm. Have you ever waxed faint? You're tired of those miserable adventures you have to be in. <laughs> You're tired of saying the same thing over and over again. You're tired of having everyone say, we're going to support you, brother. Take the leadership. We're behind you, sister. Listen to the nominating committee. And when you take that position and you step out to do the Lord's work, when you look around, there's nobody behind you. You have to do all the work by yourself. David waxed faith. Have you ever waxed faith? Have you ever gotten discouraged and decided you're going to throw in the towel? You are no longer going to do this. You had enough?
My brothers and sisters, when you are vulnerable, even a midget can defeat you. Unfortunately, Abishai, David's nephew, stepped in and rescued him from Ishbibinah. Oh, that was David's last day in battle. He was too old to fight. You know, sometimes we need to know when it's time to let it go. That's right. Probably shouldn't be saying that in Bethlehem today. I don't want anyone to come to harass me and tell me that I heard what you said, Pastor. And I've been doing this for 30 years and it's time for me to let it go. Don't bother me with that. Some of us need to retire from our jobs. job is killing you. And if you keep it and you keep going, it probably will. Are you listening to me? I'm not talking about knowing when it's time to hang it up. Some of us need to pick up our dignity and our integrity and move on to something that better suits our skill set. Some of us have been working and have been placed in areas that the Lord has not gifted us. And you it, it doesn't matter how hard you work or how well you try, if that is not the gift that God has given to you, you are going to be expending useless energy because that's not where the Lord wants you. We need to get down on our knees and say, Lord, I know you have a place for me. I want you to open my spiritual eyes and show me where do you want me to work. Some of us are working in the wrong places and making other people's lives miserable. <laughs> because we are misplaced. Trying to put square pegs in round holes. Some of us need to stop fighting in the church. We need to stop fighting against the things we don't like. You know, I always say, just because you don't like it, doesn't mean that it's wrong. There are things that happen in church that I don't particularly like. I don't get. Let me give you an example. See, praise that. I, I, I don't get it. I, I don't. I have seen very few that I can say I enjoy. I don't get it. But just because I don't like it, does that mean that it can't happen in church or it shouldn't happen in church? No! Because I have seen praise dance in church and I've seen the face of people who have been blessed by it. They get it. Just because I don't get it doesn't mean that it's wrong. There is no spiritual principle in God's word or the spirit of prophecy that says that that's a problem. In fact, in fact, if, if you read the history of Sunday Adventism and you read the history of some of, some of our pioneers, you would know that some of our pioneers, including James White, one of the founders of our church used to be tapping his finger and skipping all the people. They are. That, that's a praise that. And do you know that there were Adventists back then who said, Look at that sister white husband? Just because we don't like it doesn't mean that it's wrong. Now, if it violates a principle in God's word, that's different. But our likes and dislikes are not the deciding and dictating factor in what is wrong or right. And we need to stop it. Some of us need to stop fighting the same old battles with the same old weapons. The world 
has changed. When I was growing up, when they talk about photography and taking pictures, there was one name that reigned supreme. Kodak. Kodak film, Kodak camera. You don't hear about Kodak anymore, you don't have it. <laughs> Why? You know what happened? When the photography world began to change and digital photography came into the forefront, Kodak said, I have, I have invested so much money in film. I have a whole network, a whole chain set up to provide people with film. It doesn't make sense to me to go into digital photography because I'll be shooting myself in the foot. And so, yeah, y'all can go ahead with digital photography, we stick it with film. And you know what happened? Digital photography took links and bounds. Canon, Nikon, and all of those other companies went ahead with development and research, and Kodak still thinking about click. <laughs> and the world went ahead and left Kodak behind, and today they are nothing. Brothers and sisters, I am saying we need to stop fighting the old battles with old weapons because there are new battles to fight, and we need new weapons to fight them. And that's why we need the wisdom of God to say, Lord, the world has changed. COVID turned everything upside down. We can't go back to the old way because the old way no longer exists. And we are all standing here, wringing our hands, twisting our thumbs, saying, Lord, we don't know how to live and how to exist and how to function in this new world. That's why we need to get down on our knees. We need to come together as God's people and say, Lord, this is new territory. We've never been here before. We don't know what to do. Teach us. Show us. Help us how we need to function in a new society so that we can win souls for your kingdom. There are more giants to come. In all our vehicles, there are systems that are constantly monitoring how the car or the truck works. And when something goes wrong, a warning light comes on. If you are a wise owner of a vehicle, you would pay attention to the warning light. It tells you that there is something that you need to have checked out. You need to take it to the mechanic, let him plug it into his analyzer, and give you an idea of what sensor or system is wrong. In the Christian life, there are warning signs that giants are coming. There are three big warning signs that we are facing today. Warning sign number one, some of us are losing interest in the church. Yeah. Yeah. Hebrews chapter 20, 10 and verse 25 says, not forsaking, forsaking the assembling of ourselves together. The opposite of love is not hate. It is indifference. In too many churches, we just don't care anymore. COVID has produced a new crop of digital Adventists. That's my turn. We stay at home. And we have a cornucopia of options now. And because those options are divided into time zones, so it's the extreme better. And when you finish, you go to O. Yeah. 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 Yeah.
We are the praise team. <laughs> and then, of course, you know you got to go all the way down south yeah. to West Jamaica. Yes. You all know what I'm talking about? Yes. We have options. We have become digital advents. And you know what? It is a blessing that we have options. Now, now here is the danger of options. All those churches with mediocre programming and mediocre preaching, they are being left behind. If we don't step up our game as a church to be able to grab the interest of these digital adventists, we are going to be left in the dust. But I have a word for the digital Adventists. Okay. Oh. It's time to come back to church. Amen. <laughs> now, now, I understand that for some of you, there is a real legitimate reason why you are not here. I understand that. But I think that there are a lot of you who are looking at me on YouTube, <laughs> Facebook, Instagram, Oh, we have TikTok? <laughs> no. that, that, that's, another, that's, another, that's another generation. There are a lot of people who are looking at me on whatever platform you are looking at. And the reason why you are not in a church or this church is because you feel so comfortable. You will get everything that Bethel has to offer without coming to Bethel. I'm saying it's time to come back. You go to work for eight hours. You go down to the mall. It's not King's County, but what's the name? King's Plaza Mall. You spend two hours. You may have on your mask, but you're walking with people who have no mask. Who have what you don't know. You spend two hours at King's Plaza. But you can't come and spend an hour and a half in your church and everybody is masked. It seems like here is much safer than the places that you spend even more time all week. I'm saying it's time to come back. And so what you need to do is to overcome the inertia of being just a digital adventist and you need to come up with a plan. And so here is my plan for you. On the 30th of this month we have a community guest day. Make a plan to make that the day that you come back home. Amen. Is that reasonable? Yeah. Amen. Amen. Those of you who can't come because you have legitimate reasons, don't sit down and feel bad. Don't chill us out and say, oh, the pastor preached on me today. No, no, no. If, if you can't come, God knows. That's between you and the Lord. I'm talking about those digital adventists who could do better. But have not. My brothers and sisters, the second giant is conforming. Romans chapter 12, verses 1 and 2 says that we should be not conformed to this world, mm -hmm. but be what? Transformed. Transformed by the renewing of your mind. Mm -hmm. Some of us as Adventists have become too perfectly adapted to our environment. We walk like the world. We behave like the world. We dress like the world. We forget that God has called us to be different. If everything that you are doing as a person who is not a Christian, I am doing it and I feel comfortable, what am I calling you out of to? As a Christian, I need to be calling you to something that is different and better than what you have. Nobody's going to go from bad to worse. You want to go from good to better and from better to best. And so if we're going to call people to come to Christ and to give them a life, tell them that Christ will give them a life that's better than what you have, we have to show something that is different. Come on, am, am I, that's common sense. We don't have to 
dressed that way from a previous generation. But for God's sake, cover it. Be decent. And the third giant is discouragement. We all have those giants in our lives. We say, oh, Bethany is not what it used to be. The other church I used to go to is not like this one. People here are not friendly. When I come to church, nobody knows that I'm here. My church has wounded me. If I don't have any letters behind my name, nobody pays attention to me. I can't get certain offices here. My kids are out of control. My church is too old-fashioned. I'm talking about giants. I have a drinking problem. I worry a lot. My boyfriend abuses me. Giants. I have serious health problems. I have more month at the end of my money than money at the end of the month. <laughs> my marriage is in trouble. I can't get along with people. What's wrong with them? I can't get along with people. What's wrong with me? I'm afraid I'm going to lose my job. I don't know if I'll be able to pay taxes this year. I hate my job. I need a job. I can't sleep at night. Does God really care about me? I'm talking about giants in our lives. All the things that cause us fear and trepidation. I'm asking you, what is your giant today? What is it? It doesn't have to be something huge. It could be something small. But because you are vulnerable, because you're in crisis now, that giant seems insurmountable to you. I have good news for you today. Amen. The God you serve is able. Amen. Amen. He can strengthen you and give you the power to overcome that giant. That is riding your back right now. Psalm 27, 13, and 14 says, Wait on the Lord. Yes. Be of good courage. Don't be well. Hang in there. The Bible tells us in Hebrews 10, 23, Let us hold fast the profession of our faith without wavering, for he is faithful that promised. God has promised he's going to hold you. Be faithful. Yes. Revelation 3, 11 says, Hold fast that which you have, that no man take that crown. Amen. Don't give up. Don't give in. Don't believe that you can succeed just because of who you are. Stories told that Christian Burton, when he was governor of Massachusetts, one day when he was running for a second term, after a busy morning of chasing votes and shaking hands and kissing babies, he was famished and he went to a church that was serving food so that he could get a plate to replenish his energy. The story says that as Herter moved down the serving line, he held out his plate to the woman who was serving chicken. She put a piece of chicken on his plate and then turned to serve the next person. Excuse me, the governor said. Do you mind if I have another piece of chicken? Sorry, the woman told him. I'm supposed to give one piece of chicken to each person. <laughs> but I'm starved, the governor said. Sorry, the woman said. I'm really sorry. Only one piece to a customer. Well, the governor decided it was time to throw his weight around. And so he looked at the woman and he said, Do you know who I am? Mm. He said, I am the governor of the state of Massachusetts. And the woman looked at him and she said, Do you know who I am? <laughs> I, am the, I am the woman in charge of the chicken. <laughs> Move along, brother. Learn to lean 
on the Lord. Amen. When the giants come, and when more come, three things we can do to overcome. Prayer, Bible study, and witnessing. Somebody say amen. amen. When David was overwhelmed and frustrated and he was about to be killed, it was Abishai, his nephew, that came and rescued him as Adventists, as Christians. We need people in our lives that when we are down, when we are weak, when we are vulnerable, they can step in and say, come on, brother, step back. I'm going to handle this. I'm going to help you. I'm going to take care of this problem. I'm going to support you. I'm going to give you what you need. That's the kind of people we need to support us in God's church. Amen. It's time for me to close. One day, a farmer's donkey fell down into a dry well. The donkey cried piteously for hours as the farmer tried to figure out what to do. Finally, the farmer decided that the animal was too old and there was no way to get it out and the well needed to be covered up anyhow. And so he decided to bury it in the well. And so he invited some of his neighbors to come over and to help him to fill the well and to put the donkey out of its misery. And so they took shovelfuls of dirt and they began to dump it into the well. And as, and as the donkey was standing there, he, he felt clots of dirt coming down on his back. And, and every time a shovelful came down, he would shake it off and stomp it. They, they, they kept shoveling more and more dirt in the well. But, but for every shovelful that came, he would shake it off. He, he would stomp on it and he would step up. As the men worked feverishly all day, dumping and dumping and dumping, he would keep shaking and shaking and stepping up. The story says that after a long time, after a long time of shoveling and dumping and shaking and stepping, the level of the well was high enough where the donkey would jump out. He was free. I am saying that we live in a time when we have lots of things being done on us. Problems that perplex us. Hardships that come our way. And I'm saying to you, if you feel like you're trapped in a well of circumstance, and people are dumping things on you, life is dumping things on you, be like that old donkey. Shake it off by God's grace and step up. Shake it off and step up. Don't be diminished. Don't be discouraged. Don't let the disaster do you in. There are more giants to come, but the God you serve is bigger than any giant that can come your way, shake it off, and step up. So I ask you today, is there a giant in your life that you are struggling with right now? Is there something that's overwhelming you and causing you to be on the verge of giving up? Is there something that's perplexing you and you You've been thinking about it. You've used all the brain power you have and you still can't figure out how you're going to deal with it. My biggest for you today is to let it go and let God move in your life. Amen. How many of you want to join me today in shaking off those problems and stepping up? Jesus. Just stand with me. You want to shake off and step up? This is your promise. This is my promise that no matter how hard the trouble, no matter how difficult the hardship, I am not giving in. I'm not going to become discouraged. I'm not throwing the Lord away. No. Now is the time for me to hold him even more tightly. Are you serious? Thank you. 